Welcome to The Warehouse. Has a Sunday sermon ever left you running to Google with new theological questions? Have you ever wished you could peer behind the curtain and see how a message comes together? That's where we come in. Here at Cornerstone Church, we spend hours every week talking about Scripture. This is the place to learn about passages, dive into their context, and study the Bible's cultural background. Come to The Warehouse, where we extend what you learn from the stage. Well, what's happening, everybody? Thanks for joining us for The Warehouse today. It's me and Morgan. What up? Yep, talking about uh, Romans 5. Uh, we didn't come up with a... We didn't come up with up with a discussion question for we today. Didn't. Did you have anything that you wanted to ask? Oh, man. Um, favorite kind of tree. Kind, oh, your man. your favorite tree? Yeah. I really like this. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so not something soft. Okay. Not like a soft maple or something like that. Although I do love the color of the leaves, like of maple trees and stuff in the okay. fall. So I love that. Um, I would go something like, like an oak or something like that it's just as i mean i love how much how long it takes for it to get to the to size but then whenever it's there it's like stable and lasts for you know potentially generations i think that's pretty awesome um i like the looks of a weeping willow yeah um yeah let's see i grew up with a whole bunch of locust trees around me that have like the big long thorns okay i don't think i am familiar with those i was a kid that like played in my backyard a lot barefoot and so yeah. the number of times I would just be running and just get a, a thorn like way up in my heel. <laughs> and so it's like, I pulled plenty of those out Yeah. now. And now I feel like my kids are just kind of wimps because yeah. they've never had that experience. <laughs> you need to plant one. And, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but then I also, so just like looks of a tree, man, it's hard for, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a prettier tree than like a flowering dogwood. Yes. That was going to be mine. Okay. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Well, yeah. we bond over this then. Yeah. My mother had uh, like four in her front mm-hmm. yard and my grandma did too. So they have like a nostalgic feel mm-hmm. to them for me. And I mean, they're just, they're pretty trees, dude. They are pretty trees. Yeah. Did you ever have, have you been around a mimosa tree? Like with the little pink floaty flowers Ooh, that drop yes. down? Yes. I think those are weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what happened? <laughs> why did, why is this a thing? Why is this tree yeah. looking like this? Yeah. Wait, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. I yeah. can't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's so growing up, we had one of those in our yard and, um, yeah, I didn't realize how weird it was at the time. And now that I've gotten away from it, it's like, that's kind of odd. Yeah. No, it's a weird tree. It's a weird tree. Mm -hmm. And I can like the smell of it too. Like I can conjure that smell back up. Yeah. Uh, not where you could smell it. Just in my, (laughs) just in my mind. I Uh, can't (laughs) conjure smells like that. (laughs) Can't quite. Um, oh, is that like coffee this is breath? Weird. Yeah. yeah, it is a little bit of coffee breath. I'm <laughs> sipping on some coffee right here. Okay, well, what a great, like, off-the-cuff question. Yeah, that was good. I don't know why that came to mind, but I'm glad we I did like it. it. So, flowering dogwood. I gave, like, a whole list of trees, a smattering of, like, my portfolio. Yeah, every tree favorite trees. that you can name. And least yeah. favorite trees. I don't know. Yeah. I also like a, a cherry tree. Yeah. Yeah, we had one of those in the backyard. Those are just cool. And go yeah. and pick them off and... Didn't really taste the best, but I tried. Yeah. 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 We had like a little apple tree that mm. was the same. Like the apples yep. never got very big and they were just yeah. like very sour and yes. weird. Yep. Yeah. But it was had, fun when I was a kid. We had a mulberry tree. Is that a tree or a bush? Mm. I don't know. Mulberry. mulberry? I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with a bush. <laughs> I have no backing or evidence for why, but I think okay. it's a bush. Well, if you know whether it's a tree or a bush, <laughs> email us. Yeah. We're asking the question on our team. Or I could just Google it, which I will at some point after we get off this. Okay. Well, I feel like that was some enriching conversation. And interestingly, like pretty closely tied to our text today in the fact that it's not related in any way. Yes, exactly. So. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Romans 5, 1 through 11, we are <clears throat> introducing. So this is, in, this is interesting because we are coming out of... A nine-month series, yeah. longest series in the history of Cornerstone, Wow! Um, as far as I'm aware, where we went through each of these nine relational skills um, of our rule of life with follow. And 
Uh, coming out of that, we're entering into a new series where we're talking about like another really important formative influence in mm-hmm. our lives. When are we think about um, like the things that form us? We think of the stories we believe, our habits, and then our relationships or yeah. the people we follow, um, the people we're around. And so I don't know, I haven't heard for sure a title for this series, but um, we're going to be talking about what it means to surround yourself with a circle of friends. Yeah. Um, and with that, it's like, it's not just friends in general, although there's a lot of merit to that as far as just having human relationships. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of studies that show the benefits of just having friends in general. But when we're talking about spiritual formation in particular, we're looking for a specific kind of friend. And that's kind of what we're going to be defining throughout this series yep. is what do those like deep friendships that help form us into the image of Christ, what do those look like? Uh, and I love it. I think it's a, a five-week series mm-hmm. as far as I know. And the introduction for us is going to be laying a foundation for friendship with God before we start talking about even these, um, what it means to have friendships with other humans. So yeah, that's where I love we're starting. It. Yeah, I'm excited. This is going to be good stuff. It is. Um, <clears throat> before we get into the text, uh, let's let's hear some big ideas. What was your big idea from this one? Uh, faith in Jesus equals peace with God. I love it. Yeah, I just had the same question that Michael asked, and I realized he, he asked it, which yes. is did, whether you typed in an equal symbol or wrote the word equals, but yeah. you wrote the word equals. I wrote the word equals. Yeah. I like it. Uh, mine was, Jesus saves us from the wrath of God and secures God's pleasure toward us. Good. Good. <clears throat> okay, let's talk context of the book then, Book of Romans. Um, what do we know about it, Morgan? Well, we know that the author was Paul. Yep. Um, and it was probably written around uh, AD 57. This would have been during his third missionary journey mm-hmm. in Corinth or Greece. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was on his way to Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. um, his goal was to go from Jerusalem to go to Spain eventually and go yep. visit Rome. But he hadn't yet done that whenever yep. he wrote this letter. Um, so and he says as much in the beginning, yes. like, or in the letter, like, Hey, I've long wanted to come to you guys, but yep. I've been prevented so far. Yep. Yeah. And so he had this big idea of wanting the church in Rome to be like this home base mm-hmm. for the gospel in Spain. Um, he had like I said, he'd never been there, but Rome was becoming well known. He knew what, like it being like this Mecca and mm-hmm. this, this area where people were coming and going, there was just big stuff happening in Rome. Yeah. And he knew that it was vital and just like super important that they would understand the gospel, that they yeah. would know what it was like to live as a true Christ follower. Yeah. So he's like, hey, I'm going to send this over to you, send you this letter. Here is, um, man, the gospel in yeah, a nutshell. Right, right. And he like lays it all out in yeah. Romans. And it's just this beautiful like theology that he gives them to like for them to build off of and yes. grow, which is really cool. I love that. I've been fascinated in in uh, recent um, recent years in like, the history around this of what was going on in this church. Cause if you think about it, like the gospel spread first to the Jews. Mm-hmm. And so Jews are coming to know Jesus as the long awaited Messiah. And they have all this background and history in what we now call the old Testament. Yep. Um, and then the gospel spreads to the Gentiles. Like Peter has that vision of the, um, the net being let down and all that. Um, and then like the gospel spreads to the Gentiles and it's expanding and expanding. And so the church in Rome would have started out as a, a church of Jewish believers. Yep. Um, and so it would have had a very Jewish flavor to it. Mm-hmm. And then Gentiles start being saved. And so they're now incorporated into that body. Um, and then there's this thing that happens with Emperor Claudius where he kicks all the Jews out of mm. Rome. And so all of a sudden it goes from being like, um, both like Jew and Gentile to exclusively Gentile while yep. the Jews are in uh, dispersion um, or in exile. And then a few years later, um, the Jews come back, but like the church that they're, <laughs> that they're looking at as they come back into, into Rome uh, doesn't look like the church that they yeah. left because it's taken on distinctly uh, Jewish, I'm sorry, distinctly Gentile yep. flavor. And so with that, you can imagine like all of the, if you think about like what, Um, what Jews would have believed about God and their practices and lifestyle versus what um, Gentiles are bringing into it um, and the different kinds of issues and problems and worldview that they had Mm -hmm. uh, from like more Greek and Roman thought. Um, It's really interesting to think of like what that mixture would have been like whenever they start trying to now have unity with very diverse backgrounds. Right. Yeah. 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 That's super interesting. Yeah. So I love that whenever Paul thinks 
hey, we need something that unifies this church, that yeah. helps bring them together. Mm-hmm. Um, he teaches them doctrine. Yep. Because like doctrine, whenever it's done right, should be unifying, not um, not uh, divisive. Sure. Um, yep. And so he establishes them uh, in a firm foundation of the gospel. And that's what that's one of the reasons I love to read the book of Romans. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it is really good whenever you think about it with all that context in there of... It just frames up for you what was going through Paul's mind yeah. in writing this letter, yeah. which is super helpful. Yeah, because there's a, I think there's kind of a, there would have been an, uh, a natural inclination toward like Jews feeling like maybe that it was easier for them to be saved because right. they were, you know, part of God's chosen mm-hmm. people before yeah. and the Gentiles were kind of maybe like second class. That I don't, I don't know. I'm not trying to like throw that onto it, but it's like, it would have been easy for that to be the case. Yep. And so for Paul to just like start from ground zero and say, God created and mankind, Jews and Gentiles all rebelled against God yeah. and were all like guilty of uh, rebellion and becoming his enemies, objects of wrath, children of Satan. Like yeah. um, that's the way he describes uh, us apart from Christ. And that it's like so unified in creation, yep. unified in the fall, yep. and then unified in redemption. That Christ, like salvation is the same for yep. Jew and Gentile. Yep, for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Anything else? Um, anything else you want to highlight contextually before we jump in? Um, the only thing uh, that I have is more direct. Like, so right before this and the chapters leading up to this one, it, it is kind of building off what you were talking about. I mean, uh, Paul is proving that point that all men are, are guilty of sin, that they need salvation. And then he also, um, is talking about justification through mm-hmm. faith and faith alone. Um, so not works. And then he uses Abraham as yeah. the example of that, which I thought was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's this promise to Abraham that didn't uh, come through the law, but came through faith. Um, like what was being promised to Abraham had nothing to do with what he was really doing. It yeah. was through faith in the Lord. Yeah. And um, I just loved it. And Abraham was was so confident and convinced of this promise that God um, would fulfill this mm-hmm. this promise to him, and it was all through faith. It wasn't anything that that he was doing. And uh, Paul does this awesome thing of like, hey, just like Abraham, our faith does the same thing. It counts us as righteous through Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I just love how he sets up where we're about to go with, and you know, yeah. whether he's speaking to a Jew or Gentile. Like, uh, if a Jew is listening to this, like, man, they would have really resonated mm-hmm. with this story about Abraham. I just thought that, yeah, for sure, it's good. I love it. Okay, so then let's let's hop right into the text. Romans 5, 1 through 11 is where we're at. Um, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Mm. What do you see in verse 1 and 2, Morgan? So right off the bat, you've got the therefore, mm-hmm. um, which is always important to take a look when you're studying um, scripture to point out when it see, says, therefore, yep. okay, so what came before Building this? on it, yeah. Yep. And so it's that whole argument of justifi- justification yeah. by grace and through faith. Um, yep. It's kind of, he's he's built it out, and now, what? therefore, this is how he responds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, one of the things that I, like, tried to be careful about as we're going through this is there's a lot of words in here that we, that we use in a church context, but if we're not careful, we kind of get... Um, mm like numb to them or yeah, don't yeah, even really yeah. stop to think what they mean. So this word justified, I was looking it up and it, it means uh, to cause someone to be in a proper or right relation with someone else, um, which I was reading some and like a lot of times it's used in a more forensic kind of way, like uh, standing before the judge and mm. like declared not guilty. But also the the Greek word itself has a lot of implications for uh, not just, hey, the um, the sentence has been pronounced and you're not guilty, yeah. but also that like there was a broken relationship and now it's made right. Right. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and he's speaking about this like in, in past tense that by faith, uh, we have been justified, um, that we've been made right with God and declared not guilty. Yep. Which is huge. It's like such a central doctrine. Oh yeah. Absolutely. To Christianity of like, yep. You know, we're we're not striving to try to make ourselves, mm. you know, decent human beings and better and like hope that we make it at the end. But yes. like this is grounded in 
past reality, mm-hmm. like that Jesus Christ has justified us through faith. And that is huh, so key mm-hmm. to understanding the gospel. And like when you fully grasp that part of it, it's kind of, I mean, life changing, yeah. like not kind of, it is right. life changing. Um, just that perspective shift yeah. of not everything I'm doing is, is me like saying, Hey, if I do this, then I'll finally earn God's love or right. I'll earn this. It's no, it's been, it's been given and yeah. it's, it's over and it's done. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's like, I, like that was a huge turning point for me in my relationship with God was like, mm. whenever that clicked of like, Oh, it's done in Jesus. Um, and then still, whenever I find myself struggling, it's often because yeah. um, I'm like failing to a- adequately believe that, yep. that like it really is mm-hmm. accomplished in Jesus. Yep. Um, this word peace with God. So there's there's like a Hebrew word for peace that is shalom. That's yep. this idea of like everything is right in the way it should be and um, stuff. Th- this Greek word right here uh, has more to do with, um, so it. I'll just read the definition. It's a set of favorable circumstances involving peace and tranquility. Um, sometimes can be expressed in the negative, like to be without trouble or to have no worries. Um, and so it really does describe that lack of, of tension. Yep. Uh, which points us back to the fact that like, <laughs> like it or not, before we place our faith in Jesus, there is tension, there is strife, there is yes. fighting between yes. us and God. Yep. Yeah. I loved, um, I, whenever I was researching that word that it was talking about, uh, this is different than the peace of God that you'll mm-hmm. see in scripture and other places. I think one of the references it gave was, um, Philippians four, seven. So the, you know, and the peace of God, which surpasses mm-hmm. all understanding that kind of thing, like yeah. being filled with that peace. Um, but this is that, that, that state of like Christ brings peace between humanity and God. Mm. Um, because before that there was tension, there was division. It was like a battle between, you know, because of our sin um, mm-hmm. between us and God. And now we have this, this awesome thing to say, Nope, no more. Mm-hmm. It's all, it's all good. And yeah. it's, it's made, it's made right now. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is, it's so key. And we'll get into this more as we go. But like I was talking, I frequently have conversations with people where they'll say something like, Hey, you know, um, we're all just children of God. Mm. And, uh, and I like consistently will push back and challenge that. It's like, Hey, actually the Bible doesn't talk about all of humanity as Mm. children of God. That's something that's reserved specifically for those who are in Christ. Um, all of humanity, like all humans are created by God. They're made in the image of God. So they're worthy of like dignity and respect and love. Um, but that does not make them children of God. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's something special for those who have been justified and may, who have um, who have peace with God through yeah. Jesus. Um, one of the other things um, with just word, this is more about like the the verb tense mm-hmm. of the word. So whenever it is, I think it's in verse two. Yeah. So um, obtain access by faith, um, into this grace in which we stand. So those words stand and access Mm -hmm. are in the perfect verb tense, which has a, um, a now tense and then a a future as well. So it's this secure present position that Mm -hmm. you're in, but also the future continuing attitude, which I, I think is really cool when we're talking, when it's, uh, when we look at what it's talking about. Yes. So access to this gift of grace and yeah. we stand, um, in, you know, in this grace, both of yeah. those things are right now mm-hmm. in the moment and it's continuation. God's not going to just all of a sudden say, nah, not anymore. Or, mm-hmm. eh, you get this for two years. It's, yeah. it's, it's eternity keeps yes. going future. Yeah. Yeah. And that I was thinking again, so uh, again, just like taking a look at these words, like grace there. Mm. Um, I think of ways that we use grace uh, in modern English. And a lot of times it's like, has more to do with like a grace period. Like how long can I go without Uh, paying my bill before they come like knocking on my door? Um, Or like, give me some grace, which means like, let me off the hook. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, forgive this one time or whatever. But like grace, God's grace is not just that. Like grace means that his, um, that he's looking on with a favorable attitude um, that that we have goodwill with him. That's not just like, hey, he's going to cut us some slack. But that, like, he actually looks at us um, and smiles, yeah, and is pleased, mm. um, and has like a favorable attitude toward us. Yeah, um, it's like that idea that, like, if we're in Christ, God looks at us and He's 
proud of us and enjoys us mm. um, and smiles whenever he thinks yeah. about us. And that's like, that's huge. Um, and so many times, again, in like counseling situations, like one of the questions I like to ask is like, hey, what does God think about you? Mm. Um, because so many times I see people who are struggling and trying to like make God, like do something that would make God proud. Yep. Um, it's like, man, if you're in Christ, like he smiles when he, he looks yeah. at you. Yeah. So. Uh, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So that hope right there has very much a forward looking, like this hope of the glory of God is talking about um, that whenever Christ returns, whenever we go to be uh, in glory with him. Mm-hmm. So this hope is that eager expectation, that that full confidence and anticipation yep. that like, not just wishful thinking, but like that we will continue to stand in grace um, until Christ returns. Yes. Until yep. we go to be home, uh, go to be with him. Um, which I think is huge. Again, it's like that perspective of the eternal there um, that it, I think bleeds into this next section quite a bit. Yes. Yep. You want to read three through five? Yeah, I got it. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Mm -hmm. This is such a, like if you take a step back and think about this, this is a crazy perspective that like really only Christians can have. Yep. I think, you know, everybody likes to say things like, um, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Sure. But like, that's kind of, um, uh, there's no promise of that. Mm -hmm. It's like, actually what doesn't kill you could make you weaker and weaker and weaker until it kills you. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, um, but for Christians, like we have a different perspective on suffering because we believe that God is in control and that anything that is in our life has been allowed by him. And so um, whenever we look at this, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Mm. Um, It's that like unbreakable chain that everything in our life, like we can rejoice, we can like actually celebrate sufferings because we know that it's producing something. Yes, yes. And that's so good because uh, as a Christian and like our, what we want to do and like one of our desires is to become more like Jesus mm-hmm. and, and for our character to grow. And like that character there is it's talking about like proven Christian character, mm-hmm. um, like having withstood the test. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's so good whenever you think about that, because it, it's not just, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm happy because bad things happen to me. Right. It's like, no, out yeah. of this, I know that God is refining me. He's making me more like him, more mm-hmm. like Jesus. And it's just, it's so good. And, and, and both of these, like one through five, like all of this is such a great perspective change mm-hmm. for us on how we see how God looks at us, how we look at just mm-hmm. life in general, um, the good, the bad. It's all uh, for his glory and God's using it to make mm-hmm. us better. Yep. And so like whenever um, when I'm talking with somebody, um, this is one of my favorite spots to take them along with like Romans 8. Mm. Um because so often we're in conversations with people and like we live in a broken world. So there's lots of suffering and hurting. And if you're in Christ, then you can have a perspective on your suffering. It's like, I don't have to wonder. Like a lot of times we try to create these future scenarios of like, well, maybe in the future, like I'll get to talk with somebody else about this thing sure. that I went through. Yeah. It's like, maybe, yeah. but maybe not. Right. Um, and our hope is not in like, well, maybe I get to do mm. this thing in the future. Actually, um, there's all kinds of like what ifs and maybes, but there's some things that are like absolutely 100% take it to the bank. Sure. And that is the fact that like in our sufferings, that this suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope yep. does not put us to shame. Mm-hmm. So we can like, rather than trying to think like, well, maybe one day it'll be like worth something and God will like make it valuable to somebody else or whatever. Instead mm. we can say, Hey, what is God doing right now mm. in me in the middle of my suffering? How is he producing character and endurance in me? And how can I cooperate instead of fighting yeah. him? Yeah. On it? yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, and I love the, the hope does not put us to shame. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I read that, it's, it's so encouraging because a lot of times we can think that our struggles or like what we're going through might like threaten mm-hmm. our, our peace, mm-hmm. like the the assurance that we have with God. 
And this is just that, that reassurance from Paul that like, no, like, it, it won't. And whenever you get there, God's not going to say anything different than what I'm telling right. you he's saying now. Right. Is that you are redeemed. You are righteous through the blood of Jesus. And There's no fine print, no yep. gotcha at the yep. end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, we see here uh, in verse five, we see that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So we see in this, in even just these few verses that we've looked at already, like a very Trinitarian perspective on this. Mm-hmm. So we have um, peace with God yep. through Jesus. Um, and then we've experienced love by the Holy Spirit that's been poured into our hearts. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right there. Um, just kind of cool to see their cooperation together. They're working together in our salvation. Yeah. I can't remember who said this in exegesis. It wasn't one of my notes, but I did jot it down because I thought it was really cool. They were talking about the word poured Mm -hmm. and like what that really meant and how the poured was, um, man, I can't remember exactly. All I had here was that it wasn't like a slow trickle or like Mm -hmm. a drip or Mm -hmm. anything like that. Like this is like when it was talking about poured, it mm-hmm. was all at once. And then didn't somebody have something to say about it being the same word that was talking about the yeah. Jesus' blood on the cross? Yeah. yeah. I So I looked at like where else that word was used in the New Testament. And it's typically paired with like Jesus' blood being mm. shed or spilled. Okay. So she, this, this same Greek word is other places translated as shed or spilled. Mm. So the idea that God's love has been shed or or spilled into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I think it's, I think that's cool, especially given the fact that we're getting ready to go into Christ's death and what mm-hmm. it accomplished. Yes. I think that's like my hunch is that that's intentional by yep. Paul to use yeah, the, absolutely to use that kind of word picture. Okay. Then six through eight, uh, for while we are still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Mm. Um, so at at the right time was what stood out to me the most uh, as I was studying this. And it was that, <laughs> that God not only accomplishes things on his time and he has a perfect plan, but like at the right time was while we were still in need of a savior, like mm-hmm. sinners who needed a savior. Mm-hmm. So it's like the duality of it, of God did it, um, culturally at the right time. It was perfect with his plan. Um, you know, everything that, that he had planned out was, was perfect and it's exactly the way it should have been. Um, and also on top of that, you don't need a savior if you're perfect. And Mm -hmm. like we were sinners who needed Mm -hmm. it. And I just think that's so cool to, to see. Um, and it just, it's awesome to me of that, like the demonstration of, of God's love through that. And I know we're going to talk about this heavy here, but, just that yeah. that idea of an undeserving person receiving this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me like you're kind of highlighting that like at the right time is, is both. And I, I was going to pull it up and see, cause there's like the two different words for time mm-hmm. in, uh, in Greek, like there's the Kairos and Kronos. Um, I'm going to look it up here in just a second. Um, but it seems to me like you're highlighting the fact that it's like, it's the right time in history. I mean, there's sure. all kinds of things you can look at that are super interesting about like, hey, there's like a shared language among yep. the Roman Empire. Um, there's all these, this network of roads that were connected for the gospel to be able to spread. So yep. it's like both about the right time in history, mm-hmm. but then also that sense of just like, at just the right time. Like if you said, hey, you showed up in the uh, in the nick of time. Yep. It's like right whenever I needed you the most, mm-hmm. you stepped in and you were there. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. So it's like, it seems to have both of those connotations, which is pretty awesome. I've heard it said that this, uh, in verse six, Christ died for the ungodly mm. is like one of the most succinct um, explanations of the gospel or like yeah. the, um, if you're just going to like summarize the gospel. Mm, like a pithy little phrase. Yeah. yeah. Like Christ died for the ungodly. So mm. Christ is, it represents, you know, the son of God made flesh, yep. the, the promised Messiah. Um, he, he died like, it, which accomplished something and he died for a purpose. Mm-hmm. He died for the ungodly, meaning that we were people who needed saving. Yep. He died for our sake. Um, also, again, I mentioned it earlier, but like this, um, we see here this ungodly and he's talking about all of us. Yes. He's not just saying like a subset. Sure. Of humanity. Yeah. Not a select few. Right. Yeah. It's everyone. 
Which goes back to what you were talking about at the very beginning mm-hmm. of the unit, the unifying thing of yeah. it was for everyone and everyone falls under this category of yes. ungodly. Yeah. Which I think is a really unpopular thing to, mm. to say <laughs> yeah. now. It's like, um, but it's really important for us to understand that we were not like basically good people who needed sure. a leg up. Sure. Um, but we were ungodly enemies of God who mm-hmm. needed restoration. And then he has this, uh, again, another just great summary down here at the end. Um, but God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, mm. Christ died for us. Yep. Yep. Pretty awesome. Anything else you want to highlight there? Probably, um, probably just the, the how big this, I, I really like this example here that he kind of gives and how impactful it was for me to think about. And it's not something that... um that I haven't thought about before, but just like restudying this is this idea behind um, dying for someone mm-hmm. who is your enemy yeah. um, is, is so wild to me because, you know, if I really sit down and think about it, I'm like, okay, do I really want to die for someone? No, probably not. But if I had to, and so I had if my it's choice. your kid or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Yeah. To, to die for someone who, who loves you is, is, is good. And that you mm-hmm. love is, is pretty easy um, mm-hmm. or easier than whenever you look at, Oh, that guy over there, he hates me. Um, he does everything he yeah. can um, to oppose me and I have to die for him. Mm-hmm. And that's just, it's so crazy to mm-hmm. think about, but that's what God yeah. did. That's what Jesus did in this. It's like yeah. probably the most, I mean, it's the ultimate act mm-hmm. of love that you could even explain. Right. Um, and then not only that was it the enemy, but, did mm-hmm. nothing like we did nothing to deserve it. It was yeah. completely undeserved, didn't earn it. Um, but it was done anyway because yeah. he loved us that much. Yeah. I'm just thinking about it. it's like and not even like as he's using terms like ungodly, um, it's not just that we lacked godliness, it's yes. like that we're anti godly. Yeah. And whenever we get into the the sinners as well, like that's like that we are actively sinning against God. Yeah. Um, so it's not just that we didn't earn it, but we actually earned something else. We earned wrath. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You want to hit nine through 11? Yep. All right. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that stood out to me, like, in this, again, I feel like I'm just like, uh, (laughs) Mr. Wrath and Judgment over here for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, It's like, what are we saved from? Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's like, we think of like, well, we're saved from shame and like, uh, a life that's like unfulfilling and sure. not, uh, um, and like feels unpurposeful. But like here, um, we are saved by Jesus from the wrath of God. Mm-hmm. It's like we are actually saved from God. Yep. Like, it's it's not quite as punchy whenever you just say, "Oh yeah, you were saved from like hmm, just this little thing." It's yeah. like no. Uh, this is huge. Mm-hmm. This is this is way bigger than just an unfulfilled mm-hmm. life. And yeah, yeah I, I like that you're pulling it out because like you said, it's not something that even anymore today you you necessarily, like it's not mm-hmm. super popular to talk yeah. about um, the wrath of God and that yeah. we literally deserved that. Yeah. And it's like, even whenever you think about it, whenever people think about hell, I think a lot of times they think about um, like being uh, either just alone or, mm. um, or like tormented by Satan and his demons. Right. But that's that's not the case. Like Satan and his demons are being punished alongside us. Yep. And who who are we being punished by? By God. Yep. <laughs> like that's that's what uh that's what this wrath of God means, which is like it's important to latch on to. Mm-hmm. And then we've got this verse 10, if while we were enemies, again that that picture, we we're reconciled to God by the death of his son, um, much more. So I think that's an interesting phrase. And we spent some time talking about that because we're trying to follow like the, the syntax, like the sentence structure along with the, um, the logic that Paul is using here. It's like, what's he, what's he talking about? Cause it makes it seem like he's getting ready to say that there's something 
like that's a bigger deal than the death of Jesus. Right. That's the way I naturally read it. That mm-hmm. much more, it's like, hey, the death of Jesus is cool, but like even better mm-hmm. than that is Jesus' life. Yep. Um, but I think there's another way to read that that makes a little more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, some commentary stuff that I was reading was saying that it's it's basically an argument from the greater to the lesser mm. of him saying uh, of Paul saying, "Hey, if God went to this length, if He did like this thing that's in, incredibly difficult and sacrificial in s- sending His Son to die on a cross to justify you uh, and bring you into right relationship with Him, then." If he did the hard thing, then of course he's going to do the easier thing, which is yeah. on the day of judgment to accept that um, yeah. to accept that payment in full. And so the uh, the life of Jesus here, representing his resurrection, mm. that demonstrated that like the work really was finished and that the payment was accepted by God. Yeah. Um. So that's how it reads to me. Yeah. Especially in the context of him talking about like how hope will not put us to shame. Yep. If there's ever that fear of like man, I'm taking God at his word, but what if I get to the end and he changes Mm. his mind or I said the prayer wrong or did something and he's saying like, hey, God already did the work. Right. It's done. Like if he did that for you, then it's peanuts for him to like accept the check that's been written, you know? Yeah, Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, just thinking about it in the... (laughs) Why would he go to the extent to do all this just for whenever you get up there to be like, technicality? "Eh, never mind. Yeah. 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 And so giving hope for the future, it's like, this is your present reality. If you're in Christ, you're justified. This will continue to be your reality that you will continue to stand in this grace. And on judgment day, yep. God has already done the work. And so he's going to cash the check. Like it's, it's done. Yep. Yep. It's finished. You got nothing to worry about. Yep. You can go, you can go forward with assurance that this is, this is what your future holds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love yep. it. Man, what so much ground covered in just like a few verses. Yes. Like 10 verses here. 11 verses. That's really yeah. good. Stuff. It's, it's so, it's so rich. And there's just, I mean, like I said, at the, at the beginning, I think to really grasp this is, man, it's like life changing for how you view yourself, how you view God. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just to, to sit down and read through this and be like, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. <laughs> Paul, you packed everything in here and yeah, yeah <laughs> right. In such a short little spot. Yeah. yeah. And so then this last phrase, this, um, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That reconciliation, again, pointing back to that relational dynamic mm-hmm. that we are no longer at odds um, with the creator of the universe. We're no longer at war. We're no longer objects of wrath. We're no longer enemies and sinners. Um, but we are made uh, sons and daughters, loved by a father. Like, that's that's the way God desires to interact with us on the daily now mm-hmm. is like as his sons and daughters, as the ones that he's, he looks at us and he smiles and he's proud and pleased because yep. of the work of Jesus. Yeah. And it's like, man, that changes the way you think about obedience and just going throughout your day. It changes your prayers. It changes the way you read the Bible. Yep. Yep. And that was what stood out to me the most when we were studying it. You were the one that hit on this pretty hard, I think. And it really resonated with me, this idea that we don't have to wait mm-hmm. until we get to heaven for yeah. God to feel this way about us, yeah. that he feels this way about us right now. Yeah. And that's why he's saying, it's not that more than that is like trying to take it away from this, mm-hmm. or it's like something extra. It's like, because of all of this and that this is the truth that we get to rejoice now. And mm-hmm. that this is how God sees us. And that was that, like I said, that really, really just hit home with me mm-hmm. of through my everyday life, I can be sitting in that perspective and that reality because mm-hmm. it's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for myself, it's like, I find a large part of the work of like walking with Jesus now is like learning to like actually believe that and experience mm. it. Yep. Um, Cause I find there's still, just still my heart just gravitates toward thinking that God's disappointed sure. or frustrated with me. Yeah. Um, and there've been a couple like very practical things that have been helpful for me with that. Um, one of those would be a practice that I call like, uh, or I, I heard it called, uh, gratitude memories. Okay. That's like, um, those times, I don't know if you've got any of these, I, and I, I'd encourage, uh, you listeners to think on, on, back on times. Do you, do you remember a time where you really like sensed God's smile, mm. like sensed that he was pleased with you? Like for me, there's one, I remember specifically like 
where I was driving, the car I was driving, the song I was listening to mm-hmm. in the car where it hit me. And I like actually had to pull over because um, it's like I realized how much um, God loves <laughs> loves me and is proud of me. Yes. Like I'm not like still working for that. And so for me, I've got a, a note on my phone called Gratitude Memories. Mm. Um, that's like I, that one I called Embracing Accusation because that's the song I was listening yeah. to. It's like... I can kind of go back and revisit that memory Mm -hmm. and experience connection with the Lord in that again. And like kind of re, I don't know, reset my relationship a little bit. Yeah. Um, so if that's, I, I, if you've got one of those, um, I strongly encourage you to like make a practice of revisiting that and reminding yourself of like what that's like to experience God's favor on your life. Yeah. That's good. I love that. Yeah. Well, I love this as a, relational base for talking about what it means to be a circle of friends because um one it's unifying yep. for us and our circle of friends two it's talking about like being a friend of god yes um and that like if we're going to talk we're going to go into talking about relational joy in future weeks and steadfast love and commitment and shared values and correction and how those play out in our circle of friends but this is such an important foundational piece i'm really glad we're starting here yep absolutely anything else you're thinking of before we Sign off today, Morgan? Um, I guess for me, it's just how freeing these verses are. Mm-hmm. Um, like the freedom that you get to experience and not in the sense of do whatever we want, but like we're truly, truly free from the chains of sin. Yep. And just as believers, we should, we should have that, that desire to stop sinning, but also to have that feeling of, of the weight being lifted off of you, that, that God doesn't look down on you, that he's not, um, upset. He's not like angry and, and any of that, like we are, we're made right. And I think, I think just fully grasping that is so important Mm -hmm. and just feeling that freedom is, it's also helpful in in how we go about being, like you said, obedient and, and fleeing from sin because you know, Mm -hmm. you have a father who just looks down on you and man, he smiles. Yeah. Love it. Well, man, thanks for some rich conversation today. I hope if you're listening to this, I hope it's been uh, encouraging and engaging. I hope that there's something you take away from it that causes you to just like pause for a moment and be grateful um, to God for what he's, what he's done to make a way for you to be with him. Um, Grateful to Jesus for a sacrifice, grateful to the Holy Spirit for being poured into your heart and helping you experience God's love. Um, Yeah. I hope that you just like uh, taste the gospel a little bit more, Uh, deeply today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, If you've got thoughts or questions or um, some of those gratitude memories you want to share, uh, we'd love to hear from you. uh, Warehouse at cornerstone.team. Other than that, I think we're done. So yeah. Thanks. Have a great week. See ya.